Thank you so much, and good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I am Jeff Rosen, uh, and this is my second week on the job as the new president and CEO of the National Constitution Center. I cannot imagine an evening event that I would rather be introducing uh, during my first uh, full time on the job than this one. Uh, we have here a superb panel of panelists uh, tonight. They are the top scholars in the country uh, about the Civil War. Uh, many are uh, close friends as well. I think you are about to have an intellectual discussion. I think I'll even call it a constitutional conversation uh, that we won't soon forget. The center is all about constitutional conversations. Each time you come here, I want you to uh, experience the best arguments on all sides of our historical and contemporary constitutional debates and make up your own mind. And I really can't imagine uh, people better equipped to be part of that conversation. This wonderful event is uh, sponsored by the New York Times superb disunion blog. And uh, I have to uh, welcome uh, the, one of the editors of the Disunion blog, my old friend and New Republic colleague, Clay Risen, who's sitting here in the front row and is now at the New York Times. The Disunion blog describes itself in this way. It says, 150 years ago, Americans went to war with themselves. Disunion revisits and reconsiders America's most perilous period using contemporary accounts diaries, images, and historical assessments to follow the Civil War as it unfolded. Uh, for those of you who haven't followed it, first of all, go uh, to your tablets and computers as soon as you get home and, and uh, pull it up. But as Clay was explaining, it started as an experiment. It wasn't clear to the editors that there'd be enough material to sustain an audience. So it was supposed to take a discrete period of time and basically day by day track the events that occurred uh, 150 years ago during the Civil War. And it's proved such a success that it's been extended uh, uh, not only to Fort Sumter, but to the entire Civil War period. And tonight we have the great pleasure of, rev of reviewing the pivotal battles uh, and events leading up to one of the Civil War's bloodiest conflicts, the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg, as you know. That'll be celebrated, or at least marked, uh, with great solemnity in November with a series of events here at the Constitution Center and certainly on the Disunion blog. It was one of the bloodiest conflicts of the Civil War. Not the bloodiest, uh, that would have been Antietam, at which uh, 17,000 uh, men died, 23,000 dead or wounded, uh, the bloodiest day in American history, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the future Supreme Court Justice, wounded through the neck at Antietam, one of three wounds he received and changed his view of the Constitution forever. Uh, but Gettysburg uh, was uh, next to Antietam, one of the bloodiest conflicts. In addition to the hard-fought Union victory, the battle, of course, yielded Lincoln's iconic Gettysburg Address, which connected the sacrifices of the Civil War with America's founding ideals of freedom. And in our conversation tonight, I've told our panelists that I, uh, the one rule of coming to the Constitution Center is that you have to uh, take place in a constitutional conversation. We have to connect the historical events to our constitutional debates, and they are going to examine some of the constitutional controversies arising out of the Civil War, including Lincoln's controversial suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, which I think that some of them may try to persuade you was not actually as uh, bad, or at least as constitutionally adventurous as you may have been led to believe. Um, in addition to this great event, we have a series of events marking the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. I hope that you'll view the Emancipation and its Legacies panel show, which we have on display downstairs. Uh, from uh, July 25th to September 22nd, I'm delighted to announce the center will display a copy of a rare printing of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln. This is one of only 26 copies signed by Lincoln that remain in existence today. Uh, this fall, I hope you'll come back to experience the expanded Civil War section of our main exhibition, including artifacts and content highlighting the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, since I can't resist a plug for this exciting event. Um, starting next uh, spring, we'll be preparing 
uh, another iconic document which you'll be able to view the following fall, and that is one of the 12 surviving copies of the original ratification copies of the Bill of Rights. Uh, George Washington sent 13 out plus one to the federal government, only 12 remain in existence, and the National Constitution Center will display one of those starting in early 2014. Um, I will now uh, briefly introduce our extraordinarily distinguished panelists and our moderator and uh, turn it over to them. Uh, our panelists include uh, my old friend uh, and extremely distinguished author, Adam Goodhart, director of the CV Star Center for the Study of the American Experience at Washington College, and our author of the New York Times best-selling book, 1861, The Civil War Awakening. And next, we have another old uh, friend and New Republic uh, colleague, one of America's most uh, preeminent uh, historians, uh, Sean Molentz. He is the George Henry Davis 1886 Professor of American History at Princeton, where he's taught since 1979. Among many books, he's written The Rise of American Democracy, Jefferson to Lincoln. And he's a longtime contributing editor, not only at the New Republic, where I've written for a long time, but also writes regularly for the New York Times and the London Times. And uh, another uh, uh, new friend who I'm just so delighted to welcome to the center, Judith Giesberg, an associate professor of history at Villanova, author of two books on the Civil War, and the associate editor for book reviews for the Journal of the Civil War, and editor of the popular ma magazine Civil War Monitor. And as our, monitor, as our moderator, rather, we are so happy and pleased to welcome Ted Wilmer. He uh, is the former director of the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University, one of America's most important centers for research into early American history. He writes often for the New York Times. He is the author of several books, and he served as a foreign policy speechwriter and senior advisor to Bill Clinton. You can meet all of our panelists after the show in the lobby, where they will be introducing and launching their new disunion book, which I know that they will be delighted to sign for you. Uh, and finally, before I welcome uh, the guests, I'll note that uh, they will talk among themselves and give us their thoughts and have a great conversation. We will have time for audience questions. Please write down your questions on the note cards that you received at registration and give your cards to the people who will be walking up and down the aisles. And finally, it is impossible to have a constitutional conversation without silencing your cell phones, so please do that uh, and make sure they're all uh, properly uh, turned off. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Adam Goodhart, Sean Wilentz, Judith Giesberg, and Ted Wilmer. Ladies and gentlemen, here they are. Take it away, Ted. Thank you so much, Jeff. And on behalf of the panelists, we'd like to say how happy we are to be here so soon in your tenure, and I'm sure it will be a very successful one. Uh, I want to welcome all of you. Thanks for coming out uh, to what is effectively our book party. Clay Risen, who was introduced, uh, helped to bring this book into fruition, but it came into fruition through journalism, through what is often called the first draft of history, uh, the, the writing of, of accounts in newspaper format, or, or, the, or in this case, an online newspaper format. And I just want to mentioned George Kalajarakis, Kay, uh, Clay's co-editor of the blog, couldn't be with us tonight, but he sends his best uh, regards. And it's lovely to be back at the National Constitution Center. I was given, I, I was Adam Goodhart's uh, forerunner as the director of the CV Star Center in Maryland. And in 2001, I was brand new in that position. I was given a tour of this facility, and it was then largely a hole in the ground. Some of you may remember it was a kind of void waiting to be filled in, and you have filled it in magnificently. And that basically is the job before all of us who love history, how to fill in the knowledge of the past. And I still can't stop thinking about the 1968 exhibit. Jeff just kindly gave me uh, and the panelists a tour of it, and I'm having a kind of um, traumatic recall of an event in <laughs> 1968. I was five years old, and my parents cared a lot about that election. And it was very important to choose the right candidate, but I was only five, and it was a little hard for me to separate Richard Nixon from Hubert Humphrey. And <laughs> my kindergarten class, which was on a military base in Taiwan, took a straw, straw poll of the five-year-olds, and I knew that 
either we were really for Richard Nixon or really against him. <laughs> and I voted for him. I cast my first vote for Richard Nixon, and I came back and told my father, and he was absolutely horrified. <laughs> So I tried to claim voter fraud the next day, and I didn't, didn't get very far with it. Well, we're going to try to fill in a little bit of uh, the void in our collective knowledge of the Civil War. And it's not an easy challenge, because so much is known about the Civil War. It's a conflict that we, we live with. We, we certainly study it in school, but it's um, a kind of historical event that we feel strong emotions about also. Robert Penn Warren, in an essay a little over a half century ago, said it's our most keenly felt history. Um, Americans know this story in their, in their bones. And we, we relive it. We re relive it in our pop culture. We relive it in, in southern rock songs. We re relive it in the battles over uh, curricula and statehouse displays of flags that uh, come up every now and then. It's a war we will never stop living with. And uh, we even learn the, the, the raw data uh, in, in new ways now and then. Only a year ago, we learned that our previous understanding, a long, a long fact that was held to be, um, to be certain, the number of people killed in the Civil War was upgraded a year ago from about 640,000 to 750,000 based on some new data. And the new data never stops. And because so much, in addition to the carnage wrought by the war, there was a great deal of reflection on the war by its participants, by the people living in the towns who sent their loved ones into, into the conflict. And uh, we, we still, with, with uh, the great revolution in printing and reading that is still happening in the last generation, we are still un unearthing new, new evidence of the conflict. And with all of these thoughts in mind, a couple of years ago, Clay and George of the New York Times began to think about a new way of telling the story of the Civil War. Uh, the, the Times has a unique voice. It's read by, by millions of people around the world on a daily basis, and it has a great responsibility to tell the story, to, 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 uh, to give us all the news that's fit to print, including all the news about the past that it can uh, choose to print. And George and Clay, working in an obscure corner of the opinion desk, decided that they would use um, a part of the paper's real estate, the online feature known as the Opinionator, which you, because it's online, you can only read it online. It doesn't exist in the printed New York Times, to begin to get at the story of the Civil War in some new ways. And we wanted to tell the story uh, following the conceit of what happened 150 years ago on this day. And we will hear a lot about this from our three panelists. And if you're from Philadelphia or, or Pennsylvania, you probably should be a little scared right now, because uh, as we are about to hear, Pennsylvania's going to come into the crosshairs of this conflict in a, in a very visceral way in just a few weeks. Clay and I can't stop thinking about what happened 150 years ago as if it's happening right now. So you'll forgive us if we go into the present tense. And we wanted to, um, we wanted to put history online in, in an immediate way. We wanted to make the writing of history open to a lot of different kinds of people, including non-academics. We wanted to tell stories of people who hadn't been in the history books previously. We wanted to uh, use visual effects. We wanted to get into mapping and art and tell the story from as many perspectives as we could. And we thought we might let it go one or two years at, at the most. And this, the series has been so electrifying to us as editors and I think to the people writing for it. And I hope to the readers as well that we're now going all the way through the entire Civil War. And we're only uh, midway through. But at this midway point, we've decided to publish the book that is uh, available for purchase. And I hope you will consider purchasing it. And so it's been a, an experiment in the writing of history generally, as well as in uh, trying to seek new knowledge about the Civil War. I thank you all for coming out tonight. And I applaud the NCC for its breadth of vision, because of course, we're a little out of the formative period of uh, the creation of the Constitution. But the Civil War was, among many other things, a profound constitutional crisis, and we will get into that tonight. So uh, Jeff introduced our three panelists, but I will say um, briefly that Sean will situate us politically. He's going to talk about what the war felt like from a political perspective at this time 150 years ago. Adam Goodhart will then talk about the cultural perspective, what it felt like to be living uh, in, in the North, perhaps the South as well. And then uh, Judy will bring it home to Philadelphia and Pennsylvania and talk about 
some of the, the people she, she's been working on and, and their sense of how the war was progressing day to day. So without further ado, let me introduce Sean Wilentz. Thank you. Can I get up there? Sorry? Can I get up there? Can I keep here? That's fine. OK. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down. I'm the old guy in this panel. I was not five years old in 1968. <laughs> <laughs> and it really brought back, you really ought to see that. I mean, especially I can see enough gray hair in this room. It will bring you right back in an instant, and it's shocking. Um, and the 1860s were just as shocking as the 1960s. Has everyone got one of these? The Philadelphia Inquirer from June 16th and June 17th, 1863. Do look at them. Don't read them carefully now. In fact, if you can read them. You can't. <laughs> no, but just look at the headlines, and you get a sense of the map, and you get a sense of what's going on. I mean, the Civil War is written about so much because it is the central event in American history, I mean, without question. Um, I, one, one of my colleagues once said that if anything happened that, I didn't either, that either cannot help you explain why the Civil War happened or what the Civil War meant, it doesn't matter. It's that important. Um, it also has inspired some of the greatest literature, some of the greatest historical literature, some of the great, greatest literature literature, um, and a lot of bad stuff, too. Really bad stuff. The worst stuff about American history is usually written in the Civil War. And so it's a, our job is to clean that stuff up, in part. Um, I won't be doing any of that tonight, though. My job here, and I'm really delighted to be here with so many old friends. Gosh, it's, it's terrific. But I was especially hap happy to be asked to, uh, to contribute a piece to the, to the disunion um, um, series. So I'm going to give you some background before we get more specific. Um, I'm going to read this mostly because I have a lot of some quotations in it. On June 17, 1863, 150 years ago tonight, an audience like this in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia would have been very confused and pretty jittery. General Robert E. Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania was underway, and it was commonly assumed that if successful, Lee would almost certainly, at least in time, if not take this city, then menace it. But reports from the front lines were unclear. Quote, this is from the, the, the paper you've got in front of you. It is hard to discriminate in the conflict and confusion of the news, which is the true view of the case, the Inquirer reported. One statement speaks of the enemy being 10,000 strong. Oof. And another of a force advancing in six columns, which conveys an idea of even larger units. In fact, Lee's main unit was 75,000 strong. Today we'll probably clear up some of the quick causes of doubt and apprehension. Let us all, however, rally promptly to the aid of the state and for the good of the great cause. And above all things, let us avoid panic. Philadelphians, compared to most Pennsylvanians, were proving stalwart in their support of the Union. Local peace Democrats were opposed to the war, actually quite sympathetic to the South and sympathetic to slavery, many of them. They denounced the war all the time attacking not least, and in very vicious ways, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which of course had been signed on January 1st. But these Democrats were unpopular in Philadelphia, and they were becoming increasingly so. In the elections back in 1862, just like our elections you know, back in the fall, it wasn't a presidential election then, it was a congressional, a midterm election. Philadelphia had voted pretty heavily Republican. There were some fresh difficulties. There was a, a new orders by, um, um, attorney, uh, by uh, Secretary of War Stanton about um, the terms for enlistment from here on in, and they were pretty strict, and people didn't like them. And so there would have been a first a rush to enlist when Lee's invasion was first um, reported, and then people kind of, to, 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 that trickled away. But with the Confederates on their way, Philadelphia was far less alienated and far more loyal than a certain metropolis 150 miles or so <laughs> north of here. We'll get to that later. More than two years into a titanic struggle that both, both sides initially thought would be over in a matter of weeks with little loss of life, the war was taking a deep, deep toll. Although overall, by this point, the Confederacy had more reasons for confidence than the, and then the Union did on this night 150 years ago. After the Battle of Antietam, which was mentioned the bloodiest day in American history, through the war, a winter of 1862 and 63, and then on into the spring, Robert E. Lee had triumphed in one major battle after another, capped by his astounding victory at Chancellorsville in early May, in which he defeated a force twice the size of his own, com commanded by Joseph Hooker. 
one of the you know, proceedings of a, a failed Union generals until Grant. The victory had been very costly, 13,000 Confederate casualties, 22% of their entire force, with the greatest loss of that, of, you know, being that of Thomas Stonewall Jackson, who was cool, killed from wounds inflicted by friendly fire. Yet so long were the odds, and so smashing was the result at Chancellorsville, that morale among Lee's troops reached the highest level of the entire war. My God, President Lincoln moaned when he received news of the outcome in the State Department telegraph office. What will the country say? Lee himself had come to regard his army as invincible. And so, in mid-May, he persuaded President Jefferson Davis and the rest of the Confederate high command to approve a really high-risk scheme that, if successful, would only, almost certainly lead to the Union's capitulation. Well, as Lincoln's words of despair showed, the Union's mood was correspondingly low. While the war in the Eastern Theater was going poorly, General Grant, commanding the Western forces, was having a very tough time at Vicksburg. The Northern problems were not confined to the battlefield. Um, although the Republicans still controlled a majority in the House of Representatives, thanks to a convenient alliance with pro-war Democrats, the party had lost heavily in those fall elections, which was widely interpreted as a repudiation of Lincoln's policies. With their majority, the Republicans managed to continue a quiet, but nevertheless revolutionary shift in the locus of federal power, passing both a new Banking Act and, in March 1863, a Conscription Act. But these actions only further inflamed Northern opinion. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, the preliminary version of which the president had released before the fall elections, which helps account for the Republicans' you know, de debacle, was proving more unpopular than expected, as previous sympathetic loyalists reneged at the explicit transformation of a war for the Union into a war to abolish slavery. In the Western states, so-called Copperhead politicians, led by former congressman from Ohio, Clement Vallandigham, we had a conversation about how to pronounce that, uh, uh, Clement Vallandigham were, um, were making public statements so provocative, not least with the overtones of inciting desertion from the, from the Union Army, that some considered them seditious. On May 1st, this Vallandigham, now running for the state governorship and lurking, looking to cause a blow, blow up, gave a fiery speech at Mount Vernon, Ohio, that was calculated to upset the commander of the Department of, Department of Ohio, General Ambrose Burnside. Soon thereafter, Burnside's men arrested the Copperhead and on May 6th order, um, ordered him imprisoned for the war's duration. A, a military commission ordered him imprisoned for the war's duration. Thence began an outcry over alleged violations of civil rights, constitutional civil liberties, that has resounded to this day, permanently besmirching in some quarters President Lincoln's uh, reputation and further dividing in 1863 the Union cause. The Confederates to be sure, had their troubles too. It wasn't that everything was going well, great for them. It included a recent wave of bread riots in Richmond, led by women who had been left to starve along with their children as the Confederate government tried its best to keep its, its army's body and soul together. But in the middle of, eight June, 1860, but in the middle of June 1863, the combination of General Robert E. Lee and Northern disaffection seemed on the brink of bringing the Confederates a breakthrough that might finally secure their independence as a nation, a nation with the first pro-slavery constitution in the history of the world. Thanks, Sean. And uh, thank you to Jeff Rosen and the National Constitution Center uh, for inviting us here, and uh, also to Clay Rise.